So happy Sabbath. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence into our hearts, into our homes, into our lives. And we welcome your spirit in our midst that we may communicate with you and with your son, Jesus Christ, through the spirit, and that our hearts may be united as one. We pray for those that have wandered in various ways from the truth. We know, Lord, that you lovingly call people back into fellowship with you. We know we have wandered away many times, and you have come and sought us when we were lost. And we pray this for others. We ask, Lord, that you can use us in reaching out to those who are seeking you. We ask, Lord, that as we read this evening and as we discuss and share our experiences in our relationship with you and our steps in getting to know Christ, that um, you will guide and direct this study and that this Sabbath will be a blessing to each one. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy Sabbath again. Um, now it is, uh, well, here it's Friday evening and this is our Vespers and we got a new series as such. It's, uh, it's just going to be reading steps to Christ. Well, not just reading. We will be discussing, obviously. And so I was praying this afternoon. I'd completely forgot, you know, I was going to send out the email and I completely forgot that we had finished uh, the series on the three angels messages of righteousness by faith. So we're going to, so I was just impressed to go to Steps to Christ. And, you know, when we look at our own experience, we, we will see our experience in here. And uh, the first chapter uh, that we're, that well, obviously we're going to start with the first chapter. It's the first one we're going to read, but it was not originally part of the book. It was added later. I don't know if people know about that, but uh, Alan White added it later on. Uh, I, I never heard that. Was... Yeah. Yeah. So she had added it um, when they, when they decided, I think to make it like a sharing book or something like that. So originally it was just uh, without this first chapter, but this is a very good chapter introducing God's love for man. So I'll start reading and when we will discuss some of the ideas that are here, some of our experience. One thing uh, I know that they do make like a steps to Christ version, at least I believe so, that is, um, um, what do they call that? Uh, like a 12 step version of it. Somebody has sort of worked it in with a 12 step program. And I think, you know, all of us really need the the ideas, the concepts in the 12 step. To me, it's always been about righteousness by faith. And uh, sometimes as Christians, you know, we skip that Christian experience. There are many people who become Christians and never have a living experience with Christ, a dependence upon him day by day, hour by hour. And I know all of us have experienced at times when, our relationship with Christ has been broken by various things in our lives, decisions we've made, circumstances that have arisen that we have neglected prayer and study, and we find ourselves wandering in the wilderness, uh, wondering how we got there. But the one thing that we always know is that, that God loves us. And that was something I learned early on as a child, not because somebody said that God loved me, but because I saw it. And one of the ways we see it, of course, is through, you know, if we have good parents. But even then, I saw it in the things of nature. And that's what this is going to talk about uh, at first. <clears throat> okay. So nature and revelation alike testify of God's love. Our Father in heaven is the source of life, of wisdom, and of joy. Look at the wonderful and beautiful things of nature. Think of their marvelous adap adaptation to the needs and happiness, not only of man, but of all living creatures. The sunshine and the rain, they gladden and refresh the earth. The hills and seas and plains all speak to us of the creator's love. 
It is God who supplies the daily needs of all his creatures. In the beautiful words of the psalmist, the eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. And why is this not working? And that's from Psalm 145, verse 15 and 16. God made man perfectly holy and happy, and the fair earth, as it came from the Creator's hand, bore no blight of de decay or shadow of the curse. It is transgression of God's law, the law of love, that has brought woe and death, even amid the suffering that results from sin. God's love is revealed. It is written that God cursed the ground for man's sake. Genesis 3.17, the thorn and the thistle, the difficulties and trials that make life one of toil and care, were appointed for his good as part of the training needful in God's plan for his uplifting from the ruin and degradation that sin has wrought. The world, though fallen, is not all sorrow and misery. In nature itself are messages of hope and comfort. There are flowers upon the thistles, and the thorns are covered with roses. Now, um, any thoughts that people have? I have lots of thoughts, but uh, nature and revelation testify of God's love. So we have scriptures. Now, Kelly, you being there, what's the difference being in nature compared to when you were living in Calgary? Uh, one scripture that really comes to mind when I'm sitting and watching our first snowfall and so on. Yeah, you got snow there. Be still. Yeah. Be, be still and know that I am God. Um, while, while in treatment, what, my home group counselor, he would always say, don't be afraid. He'd tell people, don't be afraid to be bored. And I, I thought about that. And the idea is don't be afraid to be still and quiet. And people can be really uncomfortable in quietness because that's when our thoughts start to tumble in. But uh, that's the experience that I'm having out in the wilderness as compared to the city. When I was living in Calgary, I was next to a major highway, Deerfoot, and not far. Or from a, a fire hall, and it was sirens and steady hum of the city 24 hours a day. And out here, if a vehicle goes by, it'll be the snow plow once in a while. And mm -hmm. that's it. That's yeah. it. <laughs> I'm at the end that's of the road. I, so that's why I like walking at three o'clock in the morning because it's really quiet. Even the dogs don't bark at three in the morning, which is weird, but they don't. Yeah. So, um, also my favorite time of day, even in the city, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's quiet. It's quiet. Yeah. And I, I like being alone with, with my own thoughts. It's one thing I really enjoyed when I was in Australia, uh, working in the field there. And, you know, a lot of people, they try to have like, you know, music playing. They got, you know, their phones or whatever with, uh, you know, their earbuds in all the time. You know, you see people going for walks and they're, they're always listening to stuff, which I can't do. You know, I, I have to have my thoughts when I'm walking. But, you know, some people have to have constant stimulation. And uh, I think a lot of people don't realize it. Or I, I, I don't realize it until I go to the city. When you go to the city to do something, you know, you apart from the weird ones like men walking down the street with a dress on, but basically, um, you know, there's lots of distractions. The, the, um, Every person that walks past you is a distraction. And, you know, yeah, you know whatever they're wearing, whatever. But um, when you're back in the country, and this is, I think it's the most important, and I, I've, I've tried to have sermons on this, to, to recognize the thoughts. Most people don't recognize the thoughts in their head. And mm -hmm. I, when I tried to explain it, they don't understand it. But when you're in the country you, where, where there's no distractions, you have that peace of God which surpasses all understanding, guards your heart and your mind. And that's basically, I believe, what God is trying to do. He's getting a people like Jesus, who was, who, whose eye was on, on him, and that was it. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, nature, there's, there's obviously nature. When I go backpacking, I'm in nature. But even, like, cooperating with nature and, like, gardening, um, there's lessons to be learned there. And um, 
I, I know when I was at uh, Silver Hills, which you know is obviously in the country, a self-supporting school, and I'd been there for a few months. Uh, my sister-in-law, Michelle, Auntie Michelle, she was there for quite a while, and and I I drove her back to Edmonton. She wanted to go back to Edmonton, so I drove her back. I'm not sure it was was it in the spring, maybe the following spring, but anyway, I remember like we were so so used to in nature, like opening up and looking at the things around you. When you're in the city, you learn to block things out. And so when we were out in nature, we were we were learning to sort of observe things. When we got into the city, we were bombarded. We weren't used to to blocking things out anymore. Right? We both noticed it, you know. And 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 that's one of the things that, that happens with noise and everything. You block everything out. When it's quiet, you learn to listen. You know, when it's when there's nature there, you learn to observe. And and so it's a different response. Like God is there in nature. And, uh, you know, we, we've all experienced it. God is love is written upon every opening bud, upon every spire of springing grass, the lovely, lovely birds making the air vocal with their happy songs, the delicately tinted flowers in their perfection, perfuming the air, the lofty trees of the forest with the rich foliage of living green, all testify to the tender fatherly care of our God and to his desire to make his children happy. Now, of course, you know, we, we in the previous pa uh, paragraph we had read about, you know, how God has given us a uh, trial as, as a way of, um, of teaching us. But, you know, these flowers, the things of, the, that are beautiful. So even though the, the nature is marred, in the marring of nature, we see God's, uh, redemptive power, right? The word of God reveals his character. He himself has declared his infinite love and pity. When Moses prayed, show me that, show me thy glory. The Lord answered, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. This is his glory. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Um, he is slow to anger and of great kindness because he delighteth in mercy. So we have uh, different verses from Exodus 33, Exodus 34, Jonah 4 and 2, Micah 7, 18. Of course, it's July 18. Because he delighteth in mercy. That's Micah 7, 18. God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know. He has sought to reveal himself to us. Yet these but imperfectly represent his love. Though all these evidences have been given, the enemy of good blinded the minds of men so that they looked upon God with fear. They thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice, one who is a severe judge, a harsh and exacting creditor. He pictured the creator as a being who is watching with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men that he may visit judgments upon them. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. So one is, we see obviously the perversion of God's character, often in, in these tender earthly ties that she talks about, you know, parents that misrepresent God, uh, that are exacting and... Uh, uh, critical and harsh and, and all those types of things. And, you know, how, how do we speak to someone who, who has experienced that type of upbringing where they've, they've had God misrepresented to them through parents or, in, or other means, other people? Some, some it's the people in the church, you know. Uh, I just do more listening, I think. To people who've been through? Things yeah, like yeah, things like that. Yeah, well, obviously we can show 
show them kindness. Um, yeah. But I've seen people very damaged by, you know, how they were raised. And it takes time and patience. That's why, you know, I really never give up on people, you know, because we were talking about it before this thing, you know, like labeling people as, you know, in apostasy or heretics or, you know, Cora Dathan and Abiram or whatever you want to do. I, I'm not so ready to do that with to condemn individuals. I can point out error that people believe. Uh, but to take an individual and and label him in that sort of way, as if I'm the judge, I know the heart, I know the motives, I, I think is very damaging. And that's the thing is when we have people that are damaged, you know, they're going to manifest things in their character that may be unpleasant to deal with. You know, we've had this discussion, you know, a few times about a number of things and situations. And it, it's it's very difficult for me to give up on a person just because they they show that they're damaged. Um, because God has never given up on me. And I've seen him patient with me and with others. Uh, so we should manifest that same type of patience and love. Does it mean that we condone sin? Sometimes we have to speak uh, to that individual, but but you can see the difference between attempting to correct a person who's in error and just out and out, you know, casting them off as refuse, as a judge, and and that's something that we are never called to do. It's something, uh, Theodore, we need to try. As I said, I, I'm very similar. I, I, my friend who's having a problem with alcohol, I, that's probably why I, I, I paid more attention to him than I did to my dog, which I'm kicking myself for now. He, he was actually at the stage where I was asking Jeannie to bring him to live here for a while to get him out of his rut he was with. You know, he, he, yeah. gets, he just hits the alcohol that hard and he feels up feeling terrible. And he, he, was, he was actually unsteady on his feet last time I saw him. And I, my mind was all over him, and I, I was just I'm saying I'm kicking myself. I didn't take the notice of my dog, but basically it's I'm the same. I like to stick through because Jesus sticks through to the end, and we basically well, have to do our best to do the same. Well, this is why we're trying reading steps to Christ. Well, I know it's terrible your dog died, and that you know you should have taken care of the dog, and that you were distracted. But you know people are are very valuable, so sometimes it's just what happens. But um, yeah, they're so all, they're all lessons, though Theodore. When yeah, I look back and they're all lessons that we, God is teaching us to be like Jesus. You know, um, I'll, I'll use the example of my son when he was—he's uh, now thirty-six. When he was two, we were driving along in the car, and he said, "Dad, I want to go to the toilet." And he and I, he said, in honesty, I said, "So you have to learn to hang on." He said, "How do you do that?" I said, well, "Just, just I'll, I'll stop a bit further up." And I just kept postponing, postponing it. In the end, he was, oh, Dad, I'm going to wet myself. I pulled up and I said, well, see, now you've learned something. <laughs> so it's, uh, God God teaches us in a much better way and lots better examples. But I think the most important thing we just passed through then is the, the, the peace of nature. Uh, we had an Irishman working for us at one stage there over Christmas, and he, we were doing some work in Little River. And he was there, mm. he said, what do you people do out here? It's so quiet. There's nothing here. He said, that's why we're here. But, you know, we're looking two different, the city people and the country people are two different people. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, comment in the chat. As nature demonstrates the love of God, our lives also demonstrate the power of the gospel to other, to others uh, to believe in. Yeah. So, you know, so we are given as a, as a witness, just like nature is. But, you know, for some people, they've had things distorted. I mean, they haven't had nature. They can't be in a place where it's quiet. And so, um, yeah, it, it can be quite a shock for them. But, you know, one of the blessings of Silver Hills, we had a guest house, right? So we'd have people come there. And, and I really think nature is part of the heat, the things that helps heal people. Um, if you can bring them out into nature. And people are in that city environment all the stresses and pressures, uh, bring them out in nature. They're first going to be bored. 
but if you give them things to do, you know, God can come close to them. But the Son of God came from heaven to manifest the Father. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John 1, 18. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Matthew eleven twenty seven. When one of the disciples made the request, show us the Father, Jesus answered, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? It's John 14, 8 and 9. In describing his earthly mission, Jesus said, The Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 4, 18. This was his work. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by Satan. There were whole villages where there was not a moan of sickness in any house, for he had passed through them and healed all their sick. His work gave evidence of his divine anointing. Love, mercy, and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. His heart went out in tender sympathy to the children of men. He took man's nature that he might reach man's wants. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him. Even little children were attracted to him. They loved to climb upon, climb upon his knees and gaze into the pensive faith, face, uh, benignant with love. So you can see that that work is the work that we're given to do as well, to reveal Christ. Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He spoke the truth, but always in love. He denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity. But tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He wept over Jerusalem. Of course, that's the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. The city he loved, which refused to receive him, the way, the truth, and the life. They had rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with pitying tenderness. His life was one of self-denial and thoughtful care for others. And every soul was precious in his eyes. While he ever bore himself with divine dignity, he bowed with the tenderest regard to every memory, member of the family of God. In all men, he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. Um, so Kelly has a comment in the chat. Um, so you're just talking about your, your first snow today. You put some pictures there. Now, what is it about snow? Isaiah 118, right? That's, that's what I thought you were going to do. Okay, so... You know, the one thing that snow does is it covers over all of the, the filthiness and everything that we see in the city. That's one of the things. I like snow in the city. I, the Lord, invite you to come and talk it over. There's, let me see. That's a different translation. I need King James. Yeah, there we go. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So God, you know, I mean, there's obviously lessons in snow. <clears throat> there's lots of lessons in what we just read there, too, Theodore, and how God, uh, Jesus spoke to people. He spoke to them like you and I are talking about here now. He didn't hold back if he saw something wrong uh, because yeah. you be for their good. And that's, uh, I think it's something we need to do. And again, we we need the country, even if we don't live in the country, we need to probably go to the country occasionally just to be able to talk to God and get the, the, the distractions out of the way. I've, ever since I've been in the church, I've always talked to people about don't get distracted. We can get distracted by a, a bad elder, a bad pastor, a bad person, wrong work, clothing. We can get distracted by lots of things, but we have to remember God will take care of everything. 
we can get distracted mm. by the, the the things around us, but we have to remember to re be able to recognize when we are distracted, because you know um, if we keep fixed our our, our our mind fixed on God, God can lead us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's in Job thirty eight twenty two, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Um, what does that verse mean? Yeah, and I think thanks for those thoughts there, uh, Felix. Yeah. Job 38, 22, hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Well, every snowflake is a different snowflake. They ain't all the same. Yeah, well, you're never going to find two the same, you know. Now, I think here the treasures of the snow means... Like basically where snow is stored and where hail is stored, right? I think that's what it refers to. Like, have you entered into the treasures of the snow, like the treasuries? But, um, like a depository is the word. Armory, cellar, garner, storehouse. <clears throat> anyway, there's some thoughts about snow. Such is the character. Burns. Fern Snow, he was the evangelist that I first learned about the Seventh Day Adventist message. Oh, yeah. There you go. So that's yeah. the treasure for you? Yeah. Yeah. Such is the character of Christ as revealed in his life. This is the character of God. It is from the Father's heart that the streams of divine compassion manifest in Christ flow out to the children of men. Jesus, the tender, pitying Savior, was God manifest in the flesh. First Timothy 3.16. It was to redeem us that Jesus lived and suffered and died. He became a man of sorrows that we might be made partakers of everlasting joy. God permitted his beloved son, full of grace and truth, to come from a world of indescribable glory to a world marred and blighted with sin. Darkened with the shadow of death and the curse, he permitted him to leave the bosom of his love, the adoration of it, the angels, to suffer, suffer shame, insult, humiliation, hatred, and death. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53, 5. Behold him in the wilderness, Gethsemane, upon the cross. The spotless Son of God took upon himself the burden of sin. He who had been one with God felt in his soul the awful separation that sin makes between God and man. This wrung from his lips the anguished cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 26, 46, 27, 46. It was the burden of sin, the sense of its terrible enormity, of its separation of the soul from God, it was this that broke the heart of the Son of God. Now, do we have a sense of the enormity of sin as Christ had? Can we set, recognize the separation is most important, I believe, Theodore? Yeah, well, that's, that's all connected, right? How it separates us. I mean, I think it's part of conversion in, 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 as we'll see as we go through steps to Christ. But the idea when a person, like a person who's unconverted, you know, has no interest in God. One of the things they tend to dislike about Christians, I've seen this in, in uh, lots of atheists, is, oh, you know, it's all about this sin stuff, you know. And, and they just don't see how bad sin is. Right. It's, you know, we sort of take it for, Christian, for, for granted as Christians. Yeah, Jeff, you have a comment? I'm still, I'm still learning that in Normandy, you know. Yeah. The closer we come to Christ, the more we see what sin is. Right. Yeah. And, and it's hard for us to naturally see that. I mean, we, we see the results of sin, right? The consequences of sin often are all we're concerned about, right? You know, that, um, you know, we, we can see maybe the result of sin. It, it's, you know, like somebody steals something, there's a result. You know. 
somebody lies, you know, we can all recognize there's bad things, but, but to see really what sin is, how, how it manifests itself, the damage that it really does to us as individuals and how it distorts our view of God and causes this separation from God. I think it's only through conversion that, that, that we come to appreciate that. That we can, can see ourselves as sinners. Yeah, Felix? And can we recognize uh, being separated from God if we're not walking with God, Theodore? I asked this question to somebody yesterday who's happy to have been sick. And everyone, I asked, I've asked this in the church and many times too, and everyone looks at you stupid. But I don't think anyone really appreciates waking up in the morning and thinking, oh, I feel great. Uh, until they've been sick. When they've been sick and all of a sudden it, it passes, all of a sudden you think, oh, I feel fantastic. But we don't feel that like, we don't get up every morning and think, oh, I'm so happy, I'm I'm healthy. But we do it when we've been sick. Same as this separation from God. You know, I've, I think we've spoken this before about the mind, the war for the mind. And if you haven't got continual walking with God, people don't know what you're talking about here. And I think I've, I've brought this up here before. And, you know, you ask the question, you know, do you do you talk to God? And everyone says, yes, yes, yes. And I said, do you hear God talking to you? And they look at you as if there's something wrong with you. Well, actually, I think the whole purpose of prayer is to listen to God. I mean, obviously, we share with God our burdens and our concerns. But, um, you know, God already knows all of those things, right? It's not like we have to inform him. But if, we, if we're going to follow in Jesus' footsteps, what did Jesus do without being led by the Father? And it's what, this is I, what I've found since I've ever been in the church is we need to be walking and talking. Uh, and Isaiah thirty twenty one, and our ear shall hear a word behind thee saying, "This is the way you walk in." When you walk, to turn to the left, and when you turn to the right. So yeah, we may not hear an actual voice, but you know, most of the time when I'm praying to God, it, it's not so much asking Him to do something. Um, it's mostly for direction, like decisions that I need to make. I, I put those before God. And, you know, and I try to be aware of everything that's happening throughout the day, you know, what God has, you know, what what he would do. Like, you know, so you, you need to be in connection with God all the time because decisions are going to come. If you're not really prepared, you're just going to make decisions um, well, what what Kelly quoted, Pope quoted it before for uh, Isaiah one eighteen. Come now, let us reason together. This is something that you know, we're, as a Christian, we've got the privilege of being able to come and talk to God and walk with Him. And I've I've said this in the past. You know, I, I've started some days praying, God, I, I, I want to surrender my will, my everything to You. I want You to lead me and do every you know, do anything. I know He'll never take my will. Uh, and it's great while I'm following his will, but all, along the way, we'll go off the track. But um, it's something that we have a God who can do it and will do it if we actually open our heart to him. Mm -hmm. You, Theodore, you brought up uh, the 12 steps, and they are in steps to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so confession, in the chapter confession, so step five, admitted to God ourselves, and another human being, the nature of our wrongs, not not exact sins, but there, yeah. there's something that that's very uh, healing about that. And it, and the purpose is, like you said, God knows. But when we do it, when we do it, it's a, a realization of our own condition. I think mm -hmm. that's a part of about confession that it hits home for us. It becomes real. Yeah, but we definitely need to open our heart to God. Like, I mean, it's easy, obviously, when, you know, we pray in a group, but it's a little bit different than when we pray on our own. But, you know, so sometimes, you know, all, all we have is, is the prayers that we pray together. We don't we don't spend much time in prayer. Sometimes and, and sometimes when I when I kneel to pray, I don't know what to say. And and I just stay there and, yeah. I, and I just try to connect with God. And that's, again, where in the stillness in prayer, just being still in prayer and focusing on God or perhaps thinking about a verse in the Bible or something. But, yeah, I get a lot from just doing that. And, and then it begins to flow, you know, speaking to him as my friend, my best friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pouring out our burdens and, and then concerns and just 
being aware of that God is there is, is part of prayer. By this great sacrifice, but this great sacrifice was not made in order to create in the Father's heart a love for man, not to make him willing to save. No, no, right? So we can see that some people think that Jesus, you know, had to change God's mind, right? And sometimes it's expressed in that. We, we dealt with, you know, the blood of Christ. You know, it, it, it's, you know, God stands sort of as his law, you know, what is right, and Christ has come and pleads his blood on our behalf. But it's not really to change God's mind, because what we see in Christ is the mind and heart of the Father. Right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3.16. The Father loves us not because of the great propitiation, but he provided the propitiation because he loves us. Christ was the medium through which he could pour out his infinite love upon a fallen world. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, 2 Corinthians 5.19. God suffered with his son in the agony of Gethsemane, the death of Calvary, the heart of infinite love paid the price of our redemption. So, you know, we see God suffering in Christ because that's 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 the love of God that's being manifest. It's not like the Son is all loving and the God's all God, the Father's all justice. But some people do have that kind of impression. Now, that word propitiation, of course, we don't really use that word in everyday talk anymore. What is propitiation? It's it's in First John two verse two, and He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but all. For also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, Kelly, were you the one who had that Bible? You got that Bible where it had those words switched around? Was that you? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, quite an expensive Bible. We we got them for our, our wedding. Uh, they were yeah. uh, the Oxford leather. University yeah. wide margin leather, leather bound Bibles. And uh, what was that verse? It was for God. First John 2 2, for he is the propitiation for our not sins. And for ours only. Yeah, that's what it's... They put the word not before sins instead of, like, they put it, like, two words earlier. Yeah. It's to be, yeah, it was yeah. a misprint. Yeah, it was Pretty... a misprint. Yeah. I wish I still had it. It was stolen. Oh, really? I hope, I hope it's blessed. Yeah. Uh, they they stole all my Bibles except for one. Um, but, yeah, it, um, that's interesting. I hope, I hope they... Uh, find god with them yeah or somebody does right god's word never what is it cast your bread upon the waters and it'll come back so yeah, yeah, like, yeah his his word doesn't fail yeah my brother peter got mugged one time and uh, they took his backpack but it's all full of spirit of prophecy books for sharing <laughs> yeah didn't have anything in it but spirit of prophecy books. Hopefully they did some good for yeah. someone. And Jacob is the new ambassador at, uh, at the Addiction Treatment Center. I left him with uh, some books to share. I used, ah. used, to, used to share quite a few. <laughs> yeah. Jesus said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. John 10, 17. That is... My father has so loved you that he even loves me more for giving my life to redeem you in becoming your substitute and surety by surrendering my life, by taking your liabilities, your transgressions. I'm endeared to my father for by my sacrifice, God can be just and yet the justifier of him who believeth in Jesus. None but the son of God could accomplish our redemption. For only he who was in the bosom of the Father could declare him. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it manifest. Nothing less than the infinite sacrifice made by Christ in behalf of fallen man could express the Father's love to lost humanity. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. He gave him not only to live among men, to bear their sins, and die their sacrifice. 
He gave him to the fallen race. Christ was to identify himself with the interests and needs of humanity. He who was one with God has linked himself with the children of men by ties that are never to be broken. Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. He is our sacrifice, our advocate, our brother, bearing our human form before the Father's throne, and through eternal ages, one with the race he has redeemed, the Son of Man. And all this that man might be uplifted from the ruin and degradation of sin, that he might reflect the love of God and share the joy of holiness. So this infinite sacrifice, this is it's a pretty amazing thing. And I don't know if I've ever seen, like in general Christian books, them addressing this point uh, that Christ is forever uh, bearing our human form. It is he's one with us. Um, the, yeah, I, I was going to interrupt you earlier, but yeah, that brings me to what I was going to say is that in John 3.16, God gave his son, that he didn't lend us his son. And uh, in Matthew something, Emmanuel, God with us, that Jesus yeah. is, a, is a man now forever. That's that's amazing. Yeah. What, what well, you know, I explained it. I explained, uh, uh, Felix, go on. I was going to say, what we, I, I think we just went past then in the last paragraph is actually this more this relationship between the Father and the Son. And this is, this is okay, we are the children of God, so we need the same relationship. So this is going back again to what we're talking about here of um, being able to hear God talk to us and, and rely on him to talk to us. Look, if you look at this relationship with the Father and the Son here, this is something we need to learn from because this is what we need. This is the only thing that's going to get us through is if the far, if we can walk with the Father as Jesus walked with the Father, we can go through the same problems. And not only that, we can do the same good for mankind. I think we're, I think, I really think Christians are letting the world down at the moment because we haven't got the power that we, the, the apostles had in, in their day. And why is that? Because the only reason it can be is because we're not where we should be. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, in in our as we go through the series on steps to Christ, you know, we sometimes we started along the path, but you know, we we get off this path, and you know, so we're going to take you know the idea is to really take an examination of ourselves, you know, individually as we go through this this study this series. But the first thing that we focus upon is really God's love for us, and and of course, we don't deserve it. And sometimes we don't even really love ourselves as much as God loves us. And we don't we don't really appreciate, you know, what God has done in creating us and the purposes that he has for us. You know, especially when we just think that, you know, it's the pleasures of this world presently that are all that really matter. You know, we have no idea really what God has prepared for us. It is it is a life that is unlike the life that we live now in its in its motives and intent um, in its focus and sometimes that's not attractive to people right some people don't like the idea of being a christian you know that they have to well they have to do boring things and they have to study and they have to pray and and you know help poor people or whatever you know that that people have in their minds but they, they don't understand the joy that comes from having the purpose of your creation being fulfilled in your life. So it says here, the price paid for our redemption, the infinite sacrifice of our Heavenly Father in giving his son to die for us, should give us exalted conceptions of what we may become through Christ. Right. So that's what I was just talking about. As the inspired apostle John beheld the height the depth, the breadth of the Father's love toward the perishing race, he was filled with adoration and reverence, and failing to find suitable language in which to express the greatness and tenderness of this love, he called upon the world to behold it. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. First John 3, verse 1. Now, 
Uh, I've written that as a scripture song. Um, there's more to it as well. But uh, I remember a story. There was a, um, I can't remember who it was, but uh, one of the great preachers in the past, he, his conversion was going to a church. And I guess the, the person who did the sermon was just, um, was not like a regular minister. It was just a, a common man. And he did a very short sermon, which basically was this verse. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So some people might know that story, who it was, who was converted by a, a very short sermon. And, and, and so the guy was just basically saying, you need to behold God. Right? You need to behold the love. And it's just basically about beholding what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. So if we think about that, it's, you know, maybe it's something we, we don't generally think about, to become a son of God. Because Christ became the son of man so that we could become sons of God. It's, it was an exchange, and uh, I don't know if we really know what that means, but it would mean to be have the character of God, to see things as God sees things. And, and we don't see things correctly, right? Because we, we, God is love, and we're not love, right? His purposes, his, his way of accomplishing things is so different from, you know, his solution to the sin problem is very different than our solution. You know of how we try to solve problems. So when we look at how Jesus uh, describes the Father here, um, Theodore, and then then now we're looking at how John describes God here. Basically, this is what we need to be doing. And I know through our testimony, our through our experiences, we should be sharing this love. We don't have. We you can share it through our testimonies. We can share it by um, by His Word. We can share it by nature. But we have a living God. And so I'm saying, I, I see we, we need to be doing whatever's God's will. And the, the most important is our relationship with God. And then he will bring it to us, what we need to do. Yeah. So, so, and as we come to appreciate to some degree, you know, what it means to be a son of God, and we act differently. So it's, you know, she says, what a value this place is upon man. And and we can think of that as applying to ourselves, right? You know, God is, he loves me, but he loves all mankind. He loves everyone. And, and we often don't place that value upon individuals. Um, you know, when we, we see how sometimes we treat people, you know, we're, we're not looking at definitely the value that God has placed upon that person. Can I say something? Yeah. Of course. The thing is, it's it, it's all about love. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, we need to learn to love each other. Mm -hmm. Not uh, separate ourselves. We're all special in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, I've learned in the last while now, I don't know, I had just had lost my wife th three weeks ago mm -hmm. Sorry here. the most special thing is love right you know and uh, it's amazing you know god is trying to show us that right you know that we're very important mm -hmm. yeah and we, love, it, it, we need to know that right you know we can have we can have God's word, understand wisdom and all of this stuff, mm -hmm. right? You know, but without love, it's it's worth nothing. You mm -hmm. know, to love somebody, you know, like I, to have my wife taken away from me is mm -hmm. the most, you know, sick thing that I've ever seen Satan do to somebody, mm -hmm. right? You know, but God showed me through this that no matter what, we need to care about each other and we need to love each other, right? You know, we, everybody's yeah. special, right? When we can say, look at a person and, you know, 
even those we don't get along with and, and learn to look at them in the way God looks at them, right? You know, you look when Christ was here, you know, the Pharisees, all of that. He, he loved them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He gave his life for them as well, right? You know, it's so important to, to grow in what Christ is trying to show in the last days. If we haven't got that love in us, they're not seeing Christ in us. Yeah, it, it's, you know, and of course, I, I was raised in a home where that was really evident. I mean, everyone in the neighborhood, they knew that when they came to our home, that they were loved and cared for. And of course, I grew up in that home, which was a real blessing. But many people have not homes like that. And we have an opportunity to show God's love to others. And as Christians, we often fail, especially, you know, I've seen it happen so much in sort of the, the theological debates that occur. I mean, obviously, truth in God's word is important. But how we treat other people who differ with us in, in, in what we understand is of much greater importance than the things that we, we think are important, that we argue about and, well, and we, judge other people. Do we have to argue? No. Well, sometimes we do have to have discussions where we... No, diff there's, there's discussions, but, you know, like, like look at it this way, you know, that if, if you love the Lord and you want to be with him, right? Mm-hmm. Whether you look at something different, do you think that God's going to let you go, or do you think He's, he's going to He's going to help you to grow, right? Well, you know? well, I do know if I if there's something that I think that's that's wrong, and I don't know that it's wrong, I definitely want someone to correct me. No, right? man, I, I'm just, I, don't, I know I I under I understand that. I'm just saying. That, you know, we get into these battles, you know, yeah. yeah, like, you know, we've have a split church here where I live, right? Okay. And yeah, both, that's no good. Both sides from the split mm -hmm. you know, think that they're right, right? And but probably both sides are wrong. They've oh. lost the true meaning of love, right? You know. Bob, Bob, you need you need we need to look at the Bible verses and, and quote the Bible. Actually, I, 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 I mentioned it earlier on before you joined the group here today. First uh, Thessalonians five nine says, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's something that we, we need to live at. And I, I've had this discussion recently with a Mormon who kept pushing the Mormon on the on the discussion group. And he's I, I showed him from his the book of, of Ephraim, how Ephraim is one of the lost tribe, but he said he's the last line for Jesus. So it, his, his book didn't go with the, um, but I didn't, I just showed him Bible verses. And Bible verses is exactly what you said. It has, if it's not done with love, we shouldn't be putting it forward. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, but so, I think truth yeah, is how, very important. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that. Yeah, I'm not. Know, I'm not <laughs> we need the spirit of Christ in us. Before we can do anything, right? You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. if Christ isn't along with us, we can have all the knowledge that we ever wanted, right? You know, but I'm just saying that you know, through what happened in in the last five months in my house here, right? It's helped you see some things that maybe were a bit out of view. Is that how you would put it? See them more clearly. Well, you know, God gave me strength the last mm -hmm. five months. Mm -hmm. My wife had a rare cancer, right? Yeah. We did everything we could to save her life, right? Yeah, and it's definitely... I can't tell you how much I loved her. Yeah. Nobody touched her. She was in this house with me and my little girl and my mom, and we fought together to try and save her life yeah. and i seen what satan did to her right well i do appreciate you sharing that it's it's uh it's probably difficult to talk about but 
But that is the reality of, of the truth is it's not about, and, and it's so easy, you know, because, you know, I, I'm sort of, you know, a theological guy deal with Bible chronology, all this kind of stuff. And, and there are discussions, we go into detail, but so often, you know, people, you know, take positions and, and make that belief in some point of some minor detail at, at more importance than how they treat one another. Well, you know, and, obviously, and how we treat one another is, is the most important thing because, you know, you can win an argument and lose a friend. I mean, it, it, it's, and that's what ends up happening with churches. They end up d- dividing and nobody's, you know, really yeah, talking. Yeah. Kelly. Yeah. It's more important to be, it's more important to be kind than to be right. And I also want to just point out to the group there, I posted some nice pictures of Bob, Carlotta and their daughter, Celia mm-hmm. yeah, in the chat. Well, you know, like Hi, I, Bob. I have one friend that, you know, He's uh, he believes in the feast days and you know we talk back and forth mm-hmm. and you know he gets a little uptight or something when we talk about something or I says you know if you love the Lord with all your heart and you want to follow the truth God will bring you to that right yeah I don't have to try and change him. I show him what I know. Mm-hmm. I tell him, I says, you're my friend. You're special to me, right? I want to see you in heaven, and I hope you want to see me in heaven, right? You know, it's... it's uh, yeah. yeah, and people aren't saved by, you know, believing the correct things. People are saved through Christ changing their character to become like his. Yeah. Truth is is... Its purpose is to reveal God's character and to bring us into connection with God. You know, so so truth has a purpose. It's it's not a purpose in and of itself. Okay, so let let's go on and read a bit more here because I'm I'm going to want to go to bed pretty soon. Um, uh, I'd like to do this. Yeah, William. Yeah. I was going to see, um, read verse one and two of that chapter. It says, it says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Where, where of, wherefore the world knoweth us not because he knew him not. Because it knew him not yet. Yeah. Be, be love, be loved, wait a minute. <clears throat> beloved, know now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what it we shall be, but we shall know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as we as he as he is right there that's the character of god all right yeah now i, I want to point out something about this verse because now I'm, I'm not saying that this verse because people use this verse incorrectly uh when it says it doth not yet appear what he shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is People generally apply this to the second coming, right? Right. You've probably heard everybody apply this to the second coming. We don't know what um, we, it doesn't appear what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we, we we fill in that in our minds when he appears the second time from heaven and clouds of glory and all that. But well, actually, but any the way I see it, I was seeing it. Yeah, as- yeah, hey, good. Yeah, so I want to go on and explain this, but I'm just saying generally that's how people see it, right? If you, you know, most people think it has to do with the second coming. And, and Ellen White even uses it in that way, which which is true. It's not like you can't use it that way. But it goes on and says, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So they focus upon this hope there as, well, that means the hope of the second coming. 
But it says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that he was manifested. Now, that word manifested is exactly the same Greek word as the word that's translated appeared. So when it says it, it does not yet, it is not yet manifest what we shall be, but we know that when he shall be manifested, we shall be like him. And then it says, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, or he has appeared to wake, take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So even though it does apply to the second coming, it can apply that way. The point is he has already appeared to take away our sins. So we can be like him now. We don't have to wait till the second coming to be like him, right? Which many Christians just think, well, when Jesus comes back, you know, then I can be like him, right? But we need to be like Christ now. And he has appeared or has been manifested so that he can take away our sins and that we can be like him. That's anyway, I, I know that you, 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 you probably agree with me there, William, but I just wanted to point this out. It's one of those verses that when I studied it, it, it really hit me. A lot of That's years an interesting ago. way of looking at that. <clears throat> Jeff, you were saying something. I didn't catch what you said. Yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at that. Never saw that before. <laughs> yeah, because if you read First John, it's all about overcoming sin and living a Christian life now, not, you know, in the by and by. Okay, so what a value this places upon man. Through transgression, the sons of man become subjects of Satan. And through faith in the atoning sacrifice of Christ, the sons of Adam may become the sons of God. By assuming human nature, Christ elevates humanity. Fallen men are placed where, through connection with Christ, they may indeed become worthy of the name of the sons, name sons of God. Uh, such love is without a parallel. Children of the heavenly king, precious promise, theme for the most profound meditation. The matchless love of God for a world that did not love him. The thought has a subduing power upon the soul and brings the mind into captivity to the will of God. The more we study the divine character in the light of the cross, the more we see mercy tenderness and forgiveness blended with equity and justice. And the more clearly we discern innumerable evidences of a love that is infinite and a tender pity surpassing a mother's yearning sympathy for her wayward child. So God's love for us is something that we don't really appreciate. But in some ways, you know, in the relationships we have with others, with our children, with our family, it does, and it can, you know, through God's spirit, give us a sense of how much God loves us. Um, I know for me, having children definitely taught me a lot about God. So, so we can learn from these relationships. Well, when you cry over somebody, it's God putting his love in you for that person. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's uh, yeah. all good impulses come from God. They don't come from us. God is good. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, Bob, I, I'll be praying yeah, for I you. Feel when, I, I feel when I cry, Christ is crying with me. Right? Oh, yeah. God suffers with us. That's one thing that, you know, atheists and a lot of Christians don't even know is that, you know, they just see sort of God as distant and sort of impersonal. Many Christians have that, that sort of feeling. They don't, they don't really understand God's love for us because Christ doesn't really take upon human nature, right? He just make believes takes on human nature. So we dealt with that in the last series. So understanding, you know, the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. And the power of God's love to transform, you know, and it's manifest in, you know, everything that God has written in Scripture, all the Bible prophecy, you know, all of these these events in in the stories of Scripture are all really revealing God's love. Right. 
but we don't really appreciate love because love has become this sort of sentimental word. You know, love, love is, is kind of cheap, you know, in, in the, the common parlance, you know, people, people use, you know, I love my dog. I love my car, but real love, that self sacrificing love, you know, that that's really what God's love is. So, well, you know, God showed me how to be a servant, right? You know, I've been taking care of my my mom and her husband for six years now, and and then dealing with this with my wife. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, you know, it's an amazing thing to mm-hmm. I don't know. It yeah, it, you the things that I went through in the last five months with my wife and. How God gave me the strength to do all of that, right? You know, it's a... Yeah, well, uh, it's I know a, what you're talking about, about. Being a servant, right? You know, God wants us to serve as well, yeah, right? You know, and I've I've never been a person who can... Uh, uh, Kelly, so you want to read chapter two when we do that next Friday? Is that what you're saying in the chat? Who, me? No, Kelly. Kelly sent a a chat message. He said, "May I read the next part?" No, just are we done that end of that chapter now? Or? Yeah, it's the end of one chapter. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, so I was just Christ I was is the next, the next chapter. Next. We'll do that next no, Friday. Be... If you want to do, oh, okay. do that one next Friday. Can I fine. can I just ask Bob this if he if he found that um, being a servant was a good thing, Bob? Well, it's the best thing I ever did. Amen. Amen. Right? You know, I wouldn't have it any other way. Did you have God with you, Bob? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the thing I, I find is I, I have a hard time just living for myself. If all I had was myself to care for, I don't know. It's much nicer to have other people to care for. Now, we can be servants in lots of different ways. I mean, even as a guitar teacher, in some ways, I'm serving my students and considering their needs far beyond, uh, you know, just learning to play an instrument, you know, to reveal Christ to them. But, uh, you know, they are paying me too, so, you know, it's a little bit different. <laughs> um, just I will, the right now in my life, the most important thing is, you know, I tell the Lord, Whatever you want, do whatever it takes to save me and my little girl and my family. And I said, my life, I put it in your hands. Amen. I wouldn't have it any other way right now, right? You know, God is, I'm sick of this world. Yeah, it's the a pretty- that I've seen in the last five months and what kind of evil being this is. It, it, it's a terrible world, but, you know, we can bring joy to, to others. That is, you know, that's how we fight against this terrible world. No, no, I understand that. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, but, you know, but, but, but you know, Lord, us really, let's, none of let's, us really want to be here. <laughs> let's do this now, right? Let's go. It's what God is going to do in us. It's not what we can do. If you do a study in the Bible, it's all about what he's, it's, where am I in the Bible? He, yeah. he says, I will do, right? Yeah. Right. When it comes to everything, he says he's going to do it if we allow him to do it. Mm-hmm. Right? Like the only other I in the Bible is Satan. Right? Yeah. You okay. know, like even in the last days right now, right, we look at this. If God didn't allow this stuff that's coming on the earth to happen, we would have kept going for another thousand years. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. him that's going to do it to change his people. He's going to make them make a choice. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what to... Christ does in us, not what we do for ourselves, right? Yeah. You know, we say, Lord, I want to follow you. Teach me, right? Mm-hmm. Create in me that clean heart. You know, put love in me for others. Yeah. 
right? Help me to be an example. Help me to be a servant, right? You know, it, it's all what he's going to do in us. Yeah, and, and we'll see this as we go through this steps to Christ, that there's, yeah. that that's part of, of the experience of actually knowing God, right? It, but, you know, there is still steps in being able to do that because it's not our nature. Our nature is opposed to God, right? And so God has to work in our hearts to change us. Okay, so, well, we're going to close with prayer. And uh, let's let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you uh, for the time that we have uh, on the Sabbath in Friday evening in fellowship, in bringing the Sabbath hours uh, with your presence and the presence of those that uh, are seeking to know you. And we pray for Bob and his daughter. We know, Lord, the pain that that loss can have, but we also have a hope. And uh, we know, Lord, that you have a purpose that sometimes we can't see, that sorrow can blind us to. And I'm thankful for Bob and his encouraging words and the way that you have been working in his life. We know for each of us, we have sorrows and difficulties that we have faced and trials that are before us and, and trials that we are in the midst of. And we just ask, Lord, that you can give us strength, that we can uh, continue to learn of you as we study your word together. We pray for the studies tomorrow morning, and we just ask for your presence there. Bless each one, watch over them, and bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.